Hey everybody, I'm Joe Price, Wilderness Skills Instructor, and you're very welcome back to In Forest and Lands. Behind the camera pushing buttons, not just the cameras, but my own, is Ida Olson. <laughs> <laughs> Hello everyone. <laughs> Someone got to do it. Someone has to. <laughs> what, I figured we could <laughs> what I figured we could talk about today is something that's all essential in the world of bushcraft and something that I think is often overlooked, especially from a beginner side. One of those things is notching. You might hear that term bandied about in social media an awful lot, but notches are beautiful creations that allow us to further on and create even more. But also it's something to whittle around the fire, practice, it's one of my favorite things to do whenever I get a new knife. In fact, I am a knife tester on a large scale, and one of the very first things I do is carve tri-sticks. Tri-sticks are just a collection of the notches that you would use in the outdoor space, and each one of these serves a very unique and sometimes multiple purpose in shelter building and building crafts and carving when you're outdoors. So if you want to know how to make these in the ways that I've discovered and the fastest ways that I know how to do it, and also the easiest, it's very important when it comes to knife skills to not beat yourself up too much if it's this your first time picking up a knife. Just like when you're learning drums or musical instruments, it takes a long time to learn motor functions and dexterity in the wrist and this is a great way for kids and beginners alike to do it. So first we have a round over, a very useful instrument in bow drill tips. Those who may have looked at friction fire would have seen this. You can flatten a round over to make it useful for tent pegs. Next, we have a beaked notch. And a beaked notch is used for suspension systems for hanging pots or hanging sticks over the fire. Next, we have what's known as a round reduction. This is where you remove wood in a circular fashion. Great for bow drill spindles, again, for fine carving work, and also for creating devices in the woods where you need rotation or a bit of movement. Next is the well-used and humble square notch. You may have seen this in the bow saw video, but this is probably one of my most utilized notches when I'm outdoors. This is a saddle notch or a log cabin notch. You can see this is the notch on log cabins where they sit two pieces of wood together to get a very snug fit. Again, useful in a myriad of things in the outdoor space. This is a seven notch or a 90 degree latch, as some may say. And this is most commonly used for traps if you want something to sit again, like a seven or an L or an L7. So you can use this in trapping. It's also fantastic for tent pegs. Here is another version of a seven notch, where you can see it's just extended on the belly, so if you needed some things to sit together and you wanted a bit more friction. Next to it is just a straight reduction one. This is absolutely fantastic if you were using bow drills or you wanted to tin out material for a similar joint to sit over the top. Creating a hole in the middle of this notch is fantastic for bow drill bows, so you can attach cordage to it. And then last but not least, down the end, we have a pointed wedge. This could be turned with a very simple uh, extra cut on the bottom. It can be turned into a root stripper. And this is what I use for 10 stakes most of the time. So material choices and what we need for this project. For a start, you're going to need a selection of sticks. Ignore this thicker one. They're not what you want to be carving with your belt knife. This is a baton and so useful for creating notches and stop cuts. So having one to hand is always good. Remember, better to be looking at it than looking forward. Next of all, you want to choose a set of sticks. It doesn't really matter if the bark is left on or taken off, unless it's something like willow or hazel and you actually want to save that bark. But the reason why most people remove bark is not for aesthetics, it's because the bark contains an awful lot of moisture and it can take a long time to dry your green wood out or it can rot. But I like it, I think it's aesthetic. So next of all, the sticks, it doesn't really matter about size or choice. Oh Jesus, the Irish accent came out in me there, by. Oh, it doesn't matter about the size, not the size at all. So with the sticks, with your sticks, you can start off by about thumb, thumb sized. Thumb size is a great gauge when you're in the woods, but as you can see, it's not all important to the carving. The bigger the stick, the easier the notch is to carve. So starting off something like this size is great for beginners. You can work on down to an intermediate size stick and then your skills can develop on and maybe you can develop something like this. So the first one we're going to create at the top of our stick is the round over. When you want to create the round over, the grip that you're going to use is known as a lever grip. When working with your tri-stick, you always want the edge pointing away, like a claymore. Always keep the front towards the enemy. So simply take your stick and using your thumb, 
keeping your fingers out of the road, you're just going to chip and move, chip and move. The grip that I'm using in my right hand is known as a full grip and nearly all bushcraft cuts can be performed with a full grip. Now when carving, a pro tip here, is you're going to create these peaks, you're going to create these triangles. The easiest pieces of material to remove are these lines. So when you start and you push through these heavy spaces, it's going to get heavier and heavier. Whereas if you simply remove those lines, one, you achieve a smoother, more aesthetic cut, but you also get your round over. So to continue rounding over the top, you come up about halfway and you just keep knocking them off. And as you can see, my hands are out of the road, out of the way. And that would be enough to start our bow drill. So you can see the knife is traveling through and no fingers are in the way and I'm putting absolutely no pressure, just control from my right hand. All the pressure is coming from my thumb and I'm just rotating and knocking off those peaks. And eventually you can get smaller and you can see how controlled you can get and you got yourself your rounded tip. So the next one I'm going to create is our 90 degree latch notch or our seven notch or L7 notch, whichever the nomenclature you want to call it. The reason why I start with this one is because it shows you how a stop cut works. And basically a stop cut stops your cut. So the seven notch is very simple to create, with just one stop cut moving through and towards it. So normally just like a tent stake, what I would do is come down a thumb knuckles worth or two thumbs worth or an inch, an inch and a half. If you have the strength, you can rock the blade in, and this is why I like to leave the bark on, because it leaves a mark. But to create your stop cut, for those with beginning or small hands, you can use your baton. And what you want to do is baton in about a third of the way on your stick. You can see there, I'm about a third of the way in. I'll give it one more because I'm stubborn. And when you go to take out your knife from a notch, all you got to do is grab and twist the stick and it'll roll away. Don't try and rock or pull the two away. The least movement we got. Grab it like a handlebar and it should really twist out. And we've created our stop cut. Now we can place the knife on our workspace, on our anvil. For my seven notches or my L7 notches, I like to use about the thickness of my knife. Most standard bushcraft knives would be a good unit of measurement. And the reason why I only work to the thickness of my knife is because once the notch is open and created, we are going to have to maneuver our blade in and around inside the notch. So starting off as thick as the knife in a little bit is always a good thing to do. Our knives, when we're carving, should be split up into two sections. The first half of our knife, the first inch or so, is for heavy work. The other half of our knife is for light and precision work. Using this for heavy work is going to cause an accident and using this for light work is going to look like you carved it with your foot. So heavy work, light work. So first of all, we sit it on our anvil, we get comfortable, we've come up a knife in a bit and we're going to carve into our stop cut. And you can see our stop cut work there. Again, pressure is coming from my thumb, control is coming from my right hand. And we just keep carving away in that motion. The wood I'm using today is birch, green birch. And you see the fibers are coming up there. And that stop cut is nice and safe. And I will ask a question to the audience. If my knife was to go through there, it's gonna travel into the stump. Again, nice and safe. When you have it up to about here, you can break those fibers with the light work section of your knife by simply rocking the stick. I can always tell when people are out with a knife first because the knife is doing all the work. It is here and it's there and it's everywhere. It's like the Scarlet Pimpernel of the craft world. But somebody with experience with a knife, the knife will always remain stationary and the free hand will do the work for them. We can remove this, put it back up on our chest and we can use our thumb again. In we go and press, in we go and press. 
put it down. We break the fibers by rocking the stick. And then now we take the top part of our knife, doing the light work. Again, same control and thumb. See, knife ain't moving, the hand is doing the rocking. We have created our seven notch. So we've created our seven notch and we've learned how to do a stop cut and we're getting a bit more dexterous with our thumb and our working hand. The next one I'm going to create is the square notch. So first off, we're going to come down a thumb, a thumb and a bit if we want. And we're going to use the thickest part of our knife as a measurement for the square notch. Now, if you're in the field, like you see in the book saw video, this notch could have to be bigger or smaller, but as always, we want to, to be bigger than the knife that we're working with. So now to create our square notch, we're simply going to create two stop cuts. Again, using our baton, the baton in the depth of the knife. Knife isn't moving, twist the stick away. Come down about an inch, inch or so, tip it up here. I always give myself a bit for luck. It's a lot easier to take wood off than it is to put it back on. Again, twist and the knife comes away. Now, to understand the square notch and all carving, we got to imagine that it's now in a triangular shape, like so. And we are going to carve towards this stop cut. We're going to carve downhill towards this stop cut and carve downhill towards there. It doesn't really matter if you start super center, but it just helps the brain a little bit to see where we're going to go because it looks like a square, but you carve it like a triangle, you get it. So again, placing it on our anvil, nice and comfortable, going to the heavy duty part of our blade and we're chopping down into that stop cut, carving in our triangle. Down, rocking with our hand, and again, in. If you need to adjust the cutting angle, it's easier to adjust the stick than to adjust your knife. Your knife should only be traveling in a straight motion and you can bring the stick into the angle that you need. Then we're going to turn our stick around and we're going to do the same process again. Carving off that peak, nice and easy down into our square notch. Down and rocking. And as you can see, I am now in the belly of the cut. And if my knife and this notch didn't match up, it would be very hard and I would have to twist and I would have to rotate. Fine on heavy duty use knives like this, but on fine carving knives, this rotation in the wood is a very quick way to chip and roll the edge of your knife. And we just keep doing that. Now, it can be as deep or as shallow as you want. But what you're gonna see is you're gonna be left after your heavy duty work with these kind of undulations. You can see the triangle as I came in and chopped. So this is where the finer part of our knife comes into play. And this allows us to slowly level off our square notch. And we've allowed plenty of space in the body of the square notch to work. And you can see now why carving knives have such fine and precise points for when you need to do this. Also, if you are carving, and this is now smooth because my knife is so sharp, check out our stropping video. But if you notice that the fibers are coming up with it, just simply rotate the wood and the fibers will go away. It's just, you gotta cut against the fibers. Constantly getting an eye in, having a look, rounding out the belly. Again, rocking. The least the knife has to move, the less chance I have of getting cut and we have our square notch. So the next one we're going to create is our saddle notch. So a saddle notch is very easily done with the same using two stop cuts. So we're going to take our knife and as always, we introduce our stops. We come here again, again, leaving some room for our knife to work. And then what we're going to do is 
just carve a little V channel into the middle. We're just going to work that again with our precision cut. Always rotate. Never come back on yourself. Again, front towards the enemy. <laughs> then, this way. We're going to come in. We're just going to create a little roll. My stop cuts are there, just more as a safety measure. If you become a bit more experienced, you won't need your stop cuts. But you can see my saddle notch is now already formed by creating this V in here. I am now up using the finer part of my knife coming in and a little roll, and a little roll. Turn, in, and a little roll. And then just chip away, nice and easy. And you got yourself a saddle notch. If you wanted to widen your saddle notch, you simply just keep repeating the process and widening those jaws and you can take your saddle notch straight out. But a saddle notch is just two V stop cuts that are just widened and widened and widened. So the next one that you should be carving is this square reduction or it's the start of a beam reduction. But as you can see, it's very simply just a square notch on another side of a square notch and you square notch it down until you're at the thickness that you want it to be. But one that people may have not seen so much of before is the round reduction. And I'm going to show that really quickly because I think it involves a cool technique. So to start our round reduction, I always have a nice flat workspace. Again, you can work up here if you need to, if you're in the forest, but if you're only beginning out, this is the way to do it. I'm looking at about where my knife is. And I'll start here. What I do is I take the tip and press it in. Again, my knife hand isn't doing anything and I'm just rolling the stick, breaking the bark, breaking those fibers, back and forth, back and forth. It doesn't matter if it's precise, if you feel safe, you can baton it in, but this is handy. I can just apply pressure with my arm. The follow through for the knife is into the anvil and I get a nice clean fiber breaking cut with very little movement. I come down, again, I'm gonna to have to work inside this round reduction knot. So again, start with the belly or you can start with the tip and we are rolling forward. I'm rolling the stick with my hand that has the knife knot in it for a bit of more control and just coming back and forth. Nice and slow. We're in the woods. There's no need to rush. And now you've created your two stop cuts and you can begin your round reduction. Again, same technique as with the square notch. We're going to start in the middle and carve towards both. Heavy duty part of our knife. And we're just going to chip round. If you notice, I'm not removing so much heavy material this time because I haven't battened in my stop cuts. So my stop cuts are not as deep as they are on other notches and you can get a bit of travel in the bark. But I'm simply just going to chip away like a beaver. Not a beaver on Red Bull now, but just a beaver. And you can see, like in our rounded top, that I've created these channels, these peaks. So when I've completed my full circle, I start off and dominate that peak, dominate that peak, and that. And this makes it so much easier when you're carving. And then simply remove those peaks by repeating the process at the start of the notch. Holding the knife steady in your working hand and then rolling in the hand that doesn't have the notch. And don't worry, it might look all messy now, not look so beautiful, but this is the safest way for beginners to start. You can always tidy up your edge. We're gonna rotate it around, and now we're gonna complete the same progress process, nice and light, towards our stop cut. Small movements. And this is why a sharp knife is a safe knife, because I don't have to put much force behind this edge at all and I can control it with my thumb, with my hand, and get it to where it needs to go. And then what do we do when we create some peaks? We dominate them. So we are dominating these peaks here, and we are just going to remove them. Deny the ground to the enemy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, man carving. And we go. And again, we remove its little skirt by rolling it back and forth under our blade, nice and safe, no fingers in the road, and we knock it off. 
And with the power of editing, I'll show you what this looks like when you repeat that process over and over. Wow, what a knife. What wood removal, much sharpness, but that round reduction notch is done. And you can just keep, again, using the fine work and pushing with your thumbs, just keep going forward. And that is your round reduction knot. And now we're gonna move on to the next one. So the next thing that we're going to carve is this wedge. A wedge has multiple uses in the woods. It's great if your ax gets stuck or your knife gets stuck, but it's also fantastic for 10 stakes. This is what I use on my 10 stakes when I make them. But at the end of this, I'm gonna show you another technique, a nice safe technique for turning this into a root stripping device. So naturally, to create a wedge, we have to remove an awful lot of material from the end of our stick or our tent stick. So the cut that we're going to use, and I'll show you two options, because not everybody has the option to get a piece of wood and a knife so high up here on their chest. But basically, you've seen in all the notches, I've used it in a full grip with the front towards the enemy. Now, counterintuitive to most people when they use knives, we are now going to flip this around and point the front towards the friendlies. And what we're going to do is tuck our elbows in, almost like we're riding a horse or a sergeant major and we got our whip under here. And we got full control over the stick. Then we're going to tuck this other elbow in and this knife has a specific function for this to allow for extra leverage and not so stabby in the chest. But we're going to sit it all here together and then we're going to create this lever motion. Almost like doing the chicken dance from the early 90s. We're going to chip it away. And as I said, our knife should always work in the least amount of motion that is possible. So I'm going to be cutting in this direction. So my left hand, the one that isn't holding the knife, is going to adjust the angle that I need. And then this knife is going to remove the material. So again, we're going to the heavy duty knife, but the chest lever utilizes all the blade. You can rest an incredibly sharp knife directly on your hand and it won't cut you. It's only when you move the knife that you will cut yourself. So with the chest lever, we're acting like a scissors motion. I've adjusted for a bit of a not so steep angle to give myself a chance and we're going to remove. So the two arms are working together nice and easy and away we go. And as you can see, the knife is controlled. This is the range of movement that's in it. The left arm is doing the heavy lifting. I'm going to go to the opposite side, again, starting from the heavy duty section, perched on my chest and create my angles. And you can see that allows you to remove large amounts of material. Now to make sure your wedge is finishing level, this is what you want to be watching. Too many people are trying to go to the side here all the time, but if this section remains level and you can use the heartwood as a measure, well then you know your wedge is gonna close in roughly where you need to be. And turn it over here and I can see that I need to remove more towards this. I am not adjusting the angle of my knife. I'm adjusting the angle of my stick. But of course, not everybody can do a chest lever, mobility issues and such. So the next thing that I would do for a wedge is if I had to create it without the ability to use a chest lever, is the same thing. I'm gonna make sure that I have an anvil or a workplace. I have nowhere that I'm gonna strike my knuckles because I think people forget that their knuckles stick out a lot further than the edge and an awful lot of students at classes end up punching this. What I'm gonna do is get it here and this is all I'm going to be doing. Using my shoulders or if you happen to be a bit slighter in muscle mass, you can stand up and use your weight to press this down. So the next thing I'm going to do is take our wedge and I'm gonna turn it into a root stripper. Now this is probably one of the most dangerous cuts that are on the tri-stick because I see everybody picking it up here, putting arms around here. That's not what you need to do, it's very simple. You take your knife, you take it in your full grip, and as always, we do not want the knife to be moving. You make a channel like so, and this, your left hand, moves it in and out of the channel. This is how you split willow, it's how you split roots, and it's a very safe technique because if the knife over travels, you're not gonna be hitting any hands or stabbing yourself anywhere. You can simply find the center point and just push ever so slightly with your left hand and rock. And you can see I'm about, a, I don't know, three quarters of the way up the grind of my knife. You can remove it, come in from an angle, remove it, and come in from an angle, and you can just keep doing that until your piece comes out. And this is the, one of the safest methods to creating the wedge for your notch, for your root stripper.
This is actually how it was taught to me by making baskets, making willow baskets. Oof. And just keep widening it down. If you need to create a deeper V, just push a little more and come off to the sides. So the next notch we're going to create is the one that I think everybody always likes to know. The super Gucci, the rock star, the macho man Randy Savage of the notch world, the beak notch. The beak notch is kind of almost a culmination of all notches that you see on the tri-stick. As always, we're starting with two stop cuts, but this time our stop cuts are going to be shaped like an X. The steeper this, the steeper the beak is going to be. So again, we place it on a good working surface. We get a baton. And we go in about a third of the way on our stick. We come over here, we get a baton, and we go in about a third of the way on our stick. Always room for adjustments. Twist and free. Now what you can see is we've created four triangles. They don't have to be perfect, all can be sorted in editing. We are going to carve off this triangle, and we are going to carve off this triangle. Again, nice and steady. Using the heavy duty part of our knife, we are carving into that stop cut we've created. We're just going to remove those triangles. Nice and simple. Easy game, easy life. Same on this side and same here. So again, remove our triangles. And I hope you can tell now, folks, by which part of my knife I'm using is whether it's the heavy work or whether it's the light work. Now, this triangle causes us a problem. It needs us to turn around. So just like the chest lever, I'm going to show you another great, nice and safe cut. I want to get it firmly in my anvil, nice and tight, reverse grip, but this time I'm going to lock my elbows and slightly cant my wrist. And this allows me to travel back and control the knife. You can see how secure I am. I'm going to take my knife and I'm going to come back towards that stop cut. Nice and easy and off she goes. And you can see our beak notch is already starting to form. Again, place it down, rock it off. And just like our seven notch, we are now going to carve off the rest of that heavy material. So there we go, there's our starter of our beak notch, as you can see, XX, triangle, triangle. But if you want to hang a pot from this or use it as a pot hanger, you need to undercut the beak to actually create the beak that you see on it. And to create the undercut, you have to be pretty careful. So the next thing we want to do to create our beak notch, because maybe we want to hang a bale arm in here, maybe we want to hang a pot in here, or use a string for our bow drill. The beak notch has many, many uses. So what we have to do is undercut it, and this is why your beak notch should always be bigger, or at least as much bigger as you can, for your knife to work within the underbelly, just like everything else. To undercut it, we have to be a bit careful, because we got to go in flat and push, and in at an angle and push. And you need to rock, remember, knife staying still, and just keep doing that using the finer part of your knife to cut away and remove. So you're creating this triangle. Now, once this triangle is created, it's very easy as a beginner to then just want to keep getting in and keep working and keep twisting. But a wood grain is like straws. You've got to imagine a tree is like a collection of straws bringing water up and down the body of it. So the thinner and weaker you make this, this will eventually just snap. You want as much of the straws behind here as possible. So once you have that first undercut, then you just need to come in and deepen the beak with the finer knife, finer work, and just scrape it out. Don't be afraid, get in there, do your rocking. Fibers in wood can be a bit difficult to take off. Sometimes they want to come off, sometimes they don't. But then by just coming in at the angle you've created, you can then slowly begin to remove wood from the undercut side of your notch. Repeat that process until you get the desired depth that you want. But always remember, the deeper you want this, the more wood that you should remove from this side. So there you have it, folks. 
that are notches. The basic ones that you use in the woods and it's a nice stepping off point into the world of carving. There is a lot more notches and a lot more complicated combinations of notches and of course you can spend a lot of time sitting down making notches pretty and very aesthetic. I personally use notches as a functional way for me to move through the woods and most of the things that I'm putting notches in end up in the fireplace but I've created some sentimental pieces as you can see. If you have any other suggestions for any other videos that you would like to see, or if you feel that there's any topic that myself and the amazing Ida <laughs> can cover, please feel free to comment below or send us PMs. As always, your support is appreciated on this channel. It's a nice reason to get outside and to pass on the knowledge. I also admit that I do not know everything about everything. As my father used to say, that you can do anything you want, but you can't do everything you want. So if you want to see something done, please get in touch and as always stay learning keep moving forward and we'll catch you in the next video